Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to iSelect's Deep Dive webinar series. My name is David Yoakum. I'm an associate here on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to walk you through uh, today's presentation and findings. Uh, for those of you who are new to these webinars, iSelect is an early stage venture capital firm in St. Louis, Missouri, focused primarily on early stage companies in healthcare and agriculture. At iSelect, we are privileged to live at the forefront of innovation, seeing emerging problems, solutions, and macro trends at their beginning before they make their way into popular culture. We use these deep dive presentations not only as a way for us to better engage with and understand new science and technology, but also to engage with experts and entrepreneurs who are driving change and innovation in their respective fields. One such macro trend that we've been researching um, is the specialty crops industry. Specialty crops represent a unique class of crops and food products from fruits and vegetables to tree nuts and flowers. Uh, the, the products produced by this industry make up a significant portion of US agricultural output by value and represent a diverse and important source of high quality nutrition as well. The specialty crop industry has numerous unique challenges that call for similarly unique solutions. And because of this, uh, we split this deep dive into two parts. Today, we'll focus on the industry uh, and hope to better understand it, its challenges, dynamics, and opportunities. And in August, um, we'll, we'll dive back in, in part two, um, which will focus on technologies that can better serve the specialty crop industry. A few process comments uh, before we begin. We are not soliciting investment or giving investment advice in any way whatsoever. This presentation is general industry research based on publicly available information. We have invited you to do this because you're technologists, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, industry experts, early adopter customers, or sophisticated investors that are part of the ISLIC network. We value your thoughts, questions, comments, and insights into this topic, and we'd greatly appreciate it if you actively engage during the presentation. Uh, we will have an opportunity for questions um, at the end uh, if you'd like to ask any questions, questions of our speakers. Uh, finally, we ask that you put yourself on mute for the time being. Um, however, we hope for this to be an engaging and interactive presentation. So if you have questions or comments, please feel free to unmute yourself, to ask a question, provide commentary. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. And so with that, I am pleased to bring you this week's deep dive on specialty crops. A uh, brief agenda before we jump in, we're going to do uh, uh, speakers uh, introductions. Um, so you have a great sense of who's going to be on and providing a lot of the knowledge um, and insight um, from the industry today. I'm really excited about today's panel. Um, then I'm, I'm going to do a brief walkthrough of some, some current definitions and trends to help set the stage for a deeper discussion of, of the specialty crop industry. Um, and then we're going to have our experts chime in uh, a good amount on some of the key challenges and opportunities of the industry. And then finally, we'll spend, we'll spend a couple minutes just talking about some of the key takeaways uh, and some opportunities for questions at the end. Um, so with that, I'd love, uh, Vani, John, and Walt, um, our esteemed guests, would love uh, if you guys could just give us a really brief um, intro on yourself and your background um, before we jump into the presentation today. Okay, I'll start <laughs> since I'm first picture up there. Um, my name is Vani Estes. I'm the Vice President of Technology at the Produce Marketing Association. I've been at PMA for about two and a half years. And prior to that, I had um, a long career in working for uh, different types of companies, both large companies, Monsanto, Syngenta, and DuPont, and also small startup companies, um, pretty much across the whole uh, supply chain of, of growing and crop inputs and genetics. Thanks, Happy Vine. to be here. Thanks, Vine. John? Yeah, John Kuhn with uh, Wilbur Ellis Company on our business development team. Uh, work closely with our uh, partners out in the field as well as uh, bringing new technologies and innovation to our uh, customers. Uh, I'm primarily located on the West Coast, uh, but do stuff across the uh, nation and uh, yeah, just excited to be a part of the conversation and uh, learn a lot. Thanks so much, John. And uh, last but not least, Walt. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, Walt Duflock. I'm a fifth generation family farmer from Monterey County with specialty crops, cattle, and wine grapes, and a 30-year Silicon Valley career. Uh, eBay is the startup you've heard of. A couple others got acquired non-ag tech, and then last couple of years helped build the Thrive Accelerator and joined Western Growers as VP of Innovation last fall, focused on harvest automation and food safety. Excellent. Thanks, Walt. Well, we're really excited to have all three of you on today. I'm really excited to hear some of your insights and share that with the audience. So with that, I'm going to talk for a little bit, then I'm going to try and talk less. Uh, but of course, at any point um, from any of our speakers, please feel free to jump in with any uh, comments, um, thoughts, or additions that you might have. So let's uh, just to sort of set the stage here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the specialty crops industry for anybody who might be new to this topic. 
So the specialty crop industry represents some of our most beloved foods and, and some others that you may not typically associate with the category. I think when most of us think of specialty crops being fruits and vegetables, there's a lot more than meets uh, the immediate imagination. Um, included here are tree nuts, dried fruits, horticulture, and nursery crops, floriculture, and even the beloved Christmas tree. Um, Whereas the American Midwest dominates U.S. production of wheat, corn, and soy, um, the Pacific Northwest, Cal Florida, Southwest, and specifically California dominate the production of specialty crops in the United States. Specifically, California produces $20 billion in output annually in just fruit, tree nuts, and berries, and in total produces $50 billion in agricultural value, uh, which for context is, is more than the states of Wyoming and Vermont's total GDP uh, and equal to that of states like Alaska and Montana. Each year, the U.S. produces $79.8 billion in value from specialty crops, representing 17.6% of agricultural output by value in the United States, uh, and a significantly higher value per acre uh, than your typical stable crops. The top vegetables Americans buy as of the past year are potatoes, tomatoes, and onions, uh, while the top fruits consumed by Americans are bananas, apples, and strawberries. On average, um, farms that grow fruit, tree nut, and berries have fewer acres in production, but higher sales, uh, expense and higher expenses, but also a higher net income than the average US farm. Um, it's a higher risk, but a higher profit uh, game in all. So specialty crops are indeed special and important to numerous applications in the food system. Notable are their dense nutritional content, dense diversity of flavors and high value in the field. Uh, they're clearly important food in the food system. And given their desirability, specialty crops are enjoyed by retail, food service, and direct consumer markets alike. And though I've seen different, different estimates depending on the geography, it's typically around sort of 40% to retail, 40% food service, 20% to other applications, which could be consumer applications or farmers markets, et cetera. Um, so there's sort of a 20% other kind of category. On the right here, just to show a testament to the value that specialty crops hold on a per acre basis, I pulled this from the USDA's 2017 survey and then just calped out the um, dollars per acre um, on, on a per crop basis uh, in descending order with flowers and berries sort of holding the top spots, followed by tree fruits, vegetables, nuts, citrus. Um, in comparison to corn, for example, all of these gr crops uh, generate substantial, substantially more value per acre, where I think based on recent estimates uh, for corn prices and bushel, uh, bushels per acre, you'd be receiving around $550 an acre um, for corn, depending on what your yield was and what the price of at market was. So it's, it's, it's significantly higher on a, on a per acre basis compared to some of these other crops. And as we'll see, it uh, really sort of shapes the focus of, of uh, grower decisions and, and sort of what's, what challenges really drive the industry. And so some of the, some of the trends that we're going to cover today are really more trends that are associated with challenges in the specialty crop industry, but I wanted to highlight sort of three adjacent trends that I think are interesting and potentially have some applicability in sort of in specialty crops, um, and it may have some applicability going forward and may affect growers, buyers, consumers. Um, so to start, uh, during COVID-19, consumers, many ourselves included, became a lot more comfortable buying stuff online. And uh, U.S. e-commerce penetration nearly doubled in two months after a steady growth over the last decade. The Packer, whose stats are listed below that chart on the left, surveyed consumers and found that consumers who purchased produce online last year, of those who purchased online last year, 42% that they would continue to buy fresh produce online, 62% um, that they would continue using curbside pickup, 52% said they would keep doing home delivery, and 59% said they were purchasing more fruits and vegetables uh, than, than 10 years ago. And so... Vani, one thing you know, I'd, I'd be curious to get to get your perspective on here um, is that given this significant shift in in buying behavior, um, and also an increased focus on immunity boosting foods, which typically includes fruits and vegetables, do you have any sense of what this will mean for specialty crop, the specialty crops industry as a whole, and where it might create either opportunities or, or challenges or difficulties? Yeah, I think this is an interesting one because we all eat at, and we all ate during COVID and someone in our house was involved in procuring food. And so this is a very personal one for people um, because we did see a lot of our behaviors change. And as you said, just a huge increase in online shopping. And the reason that people didn't buy food online before is because they really had this idea that, you know, I want to go in and, and peruse and pick my own fruits and vegetables and no one else can do that for me. 
and now uh, people are becoming a lot more comfortable with having other people um, pick their fruits and vegetables and they've had overall good experiences and really like the convenience of, of getting it at home. So this has become something that's going to continue and um, it's estimated um, that e-commerce will grow 40% um, over in, in 2020 and, and more people will just continue to, to buy this way. Um, so it, it does have an impact on the industry as far as what the supply chains will look like. Um, I think it gives kind of a, a boost to some of the indoor ag, um, which I know you're gonna talk about as well, but um, as far as making the supply chain shorter and, and having less pieces and moving parts in the supply chain. Um, the digitization that's had to have happened over the time um, that of, of how we actually get the product, you know, from the field to these different places, you know, the supply chain change where we're going to warehouse instead of just the, the just the stores. Um, so I think it's, it's an opportunity. There's new technologies that are coming in to make this easier and more easier around traceability. And it's also an opportunity um, for growers and producers to tell their story because along with this online shopping, some of the other consumer changes were um, that people are more interested in their health they want to um, know about the sustainability and social responsibility of the crops that are grown. And so this is all going to come about in, in people being able to tell their stories more um, and getting that to, to the consumer. Excellent. Thanks, Bonnie. Yeah, that's, a, that's really, really uh, insightful context. And I think you, you alluded to the indoor farming piece, so maybe, maybe we'll jump to that in this, sort of, in this next piece. So another trend that has continued to mature uh, has been the Farm industry, um, encompassing greenhouses, high tech greenhouses, and vertical farms. It, it typically, in what we're considering when they talk about indoor farming, um, to date, uh, indoor farming has been focused in any commercial context on specialty crops. Um, so, most of the greens like spinach and kale or high value herbs, um, though I've seen others that have experimented with, um, with, fruit, with fruit crops like a strawberry. Um, and we'll um, we've seen recent public offerings for app harvest and arrow farms and significant later stage funding for groups like uh, Plenty, Gotham Greens, and Bowery. Um, the image here uh, is a highlight from a National Geogra Geographic article that I always highlight when I'm talking about indoor farming, which shows the efficiency of production in the Netherlands on a, on a square, I think, I think they do it on a square mile um, basis. Um, if you look at it closer, click on the link in, in you can sort of dive deeper but it's, a, it's an order of magnitude more um, in, in the way that they produce tomatoes. And so the yield per square mile is really, really astounding um, and highlights the potential of indoor farming as, a, as sort of a resource efficiency in a year round production tool. Um, and so I would go back to sort of Vani, maybe Walt, to, to see if you have a perspective here as well. Um, is that just sort of given the challenges that we're going to talk about in more depth, the specialty crop industry is facing and will continue to face particularly some of those are sort of outside of our control, including, including climate. Um, do you have sort of a long-term vision for the role that you think indoor farming or indoor production in general can play in the specialty crop supply chain? Um, and whether you think that this is something that will end up being a larger part of the food system or if it has a smaller role to play in sort of higher end markets? I can jump in and then Walt can, can add. Um... Certainly the growth that we're seeing in leafy greens specifically, all the growth is coming from indoor ag, you know, with the, all the companies that you just talked about that are continuing to grow more farms, you know, all the big ones now, I think are saying our next farm that we're building is going to be the biggest indoor farm. So it'll be interesting to see which one really is biggest, right. but they're all, they're all, you know, going big and building new farms, you know, plenty and arrow farms and, um, uh, bright farms on the greenhouse side. And so people are continuing to build more farms. And, and I think that's where the growth is right now. And what I mentioned before around supply chain is, is super important that, you know, their supply chain is less complex and shorter, and that has advantages. Um, so I think as, as looking forward, um, over the long term, we're just going to have to figure out what's the best and most suitable way to produce food that has the most return on investment. So we are going to talk about the problems later, but certainly climate change is going to affect how much water we have, where we have water, the quality of that water. Regulations are going to have an effect on where we can grow. So I can't really predict what the timeline is going to be, but, but producers are only going to produce when there's a return on investment. And so I think we're going to slowly see 
um, some migration where it makes sense for indoor, where you don't have as much water. So you're going to see a migration and you already see companies like Driscoll's that are doing both. And so I think we're going to see less of this fine line of, you know, only indoor growers and only outdoor growers, but we're going to see, you know, continue to see leafy green and other crop production being done by people in the industry. Yeah, I would echo that, Bonnie. Totally agree. And I think I think where indoor plays relative to, to traditional specialty crop ag is in the higher end premium segments, right? So if you've got the top hundred DMAs where you've got a whole bunch of nice restaurants and they want to do a locally grown indoor option where you can just all feed off the same indoor farming options, I think that type of setup will be popular and growing in the next 20 years. Um I, I compare it to Yelp a little bit, right? Yelp does great in San Francisco, maybe not so good in Fresno and Milwaukee. Although I suppose they might've cracked Milwaukee by now. So the question is, is from a market adoption perspective, from an addressable market perspective is, uh, can they get beyond that initial locally grown premium segment? And it's an open question because the unit economics are so tough. You just, you can't build, I mean, to Bonnie's point, you can build the biggest and biggest and biggest like the skyscraper, sky, skyscraper rush from a hundred plus years ago. But at the end of the day, it still costs money to grow. And so I think the one place where people may see a, a, a larger advantage than just building out more greenhouses is genetics, which makes the Driscoll's and Plenty relationship really interesting. Those people that can figure out creative genetics with some IP behind it for indoor specific projects, I think will do pretty well. Yeah, that's, a, that's another really um, interesting point. And I think some of, some of this mimics almost some of the discussions that we have around um, meat alternatives, whether it's been plant-based meats or, or cell-based meats in terms of the types of markets that they yep. can access over time. And, and then ultimately it ends up always coming back down to price and quality. Do you have something that tastes better than the other products out there? And can you compete on price? And so I think that, I think the quality piece is there, but the price, the price still remains to, remains to be seen. Um, the, the last, the last trend that I want to cover here, because you can't talk about impact in ag without uh, talking about uh, soil carbon. Um, and, and for anybody who's curious, um, we, we did a deep dive into soil carbon a few months ago. It's on our YouTube channel. I encourage you to check out. That was a really fun conversation. Um, but most of the conversation uh, to date about using uh, agriculture as a way of sequestering carbon in the soil has been around uh, row crop operations, largely because these are much significantly larger pieces of land. And so there could potentially be a larger amount of carbon that could be stored in those operations. They also represent some of the networks that are better serviced by those who are standing up these markets, like an indigo ag or like a nutrient, where their reach into row is, is obviously very significant. And so I personally haven't heard a ton of conversation about how the specialty crop industry gets engaged here, uh, but I, I'd be curious to get um, John's thoughts, and, and as someone who works really closely as a as a retailer um, with growers, but also also Walt and Bonnie, I would love to get your perspective as well. Is do you think there is a significant opportunity or any need for especially crop to industry to decarbonize or capture soil carbon credits? Are growers thinking about this here, or are there just simply other bigger fish to fry in terms of challenges? And this is just something that's just not a big enough issue for especially crop growers. Well, I think the opportunity is there. I think the what uh, we're lacking right now is clarity around some of the uh, requirements and regulations around and standards around the carbon piece on the specialty part, right? That uh, you look at in the broad acre row crop, uh, a lot of the requirements are, are minimum or no-till, uh, targeted or reduced nitrogen, uh, cover cropping, a lot of those additionality requirements, uh, I'm not saying a blanket statement, but they're pretty widely adopted across the uh, specialty market already. Um, well, and in permanent crops, how do you do a minimum till or a cover crop of something of an orchard or a vineyard that's been established? And so I think those questions uh, have yet to be answered. Um, I think the opportunity, like you said, the low hanging fruit prop, no pun intended, is probably in uh, the broad acre, you know, upper Midwest uh, Corn Belt area right now. Uh, hence the focus of these companies. But uh, the opportunity for um, the story of sustainable and regenerative agriculture on the West Coast, I think is promising. There's just a lot of uh, factors that need to be considered and thought through for that to really become a sustainable carbon market or credit piece. 
Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, Vani, Walt, anything you guys would add to that? Yeah, I would just add, I did a think tank um, with a bunch of our members um, last month and just brought people together to just have a discussion about this. And the, the biggest um, feeling that I got from people is that there's this feeling of like, I'm, I'm missing out. You know, I'm a producer I, um, of fruits and vegetables and I'm missing out on this. You know, everyone else has got it figured out. And so I think that was a, a really interesting conversation of, of everyone's talking about this and it keeps coming up. And so they think that there's something to be done. And, and I think what we can do, you know, as associations and people in the industry is, is to maybe try to help figure out what is the path for produce growers, because it is a different path. And, you know, uh, it's, we don't want people to go down some direction that isn't really helpful to them. Um, so I think it's, there is some possibility there to, to uh, get some carbon credits and to be good for the growers, but um, we're not there yet. We don't have a way to measure it. The regulations aren't there. The markets aren't there, but um, I think we should continue to, to try to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. Great. Well, um, there's one more slide I want to cover here uh, before we get in sort of uh, core challenges and we have some, spend some time talking through the main challenges in the industry. Um, but one thing I, we were really curious about were some of the core cost drivers um, for especially the crop industry. And so uh, for anybody who is curious to look into some of these resources, UC Davis has a really um, interesting bank of uh, studies that they've done across a wide variety of crops in the specialty crop industry. And they basically itemize the operating costs of an operation and then the value per, um, per acre on average for that operation. So obviously this changes depending on what kind of crop you're looking at. Um, but uh, I, you know, I looked at crops across strawberries, apples, spinach, and broccoli. Um, strawberries are, um, are highlighted here. And what I noticed across all four of those crops was that while there were some variations in terms of some of the input costs and some of the costs that are unique to that crop specifically. So like for strawberries, like, like clamshells for actually like storing and, 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 um, and picking strawberries into is a, is a larger cost that you wouldn't see in some of these other crops. Um, but across the board, um, when I sort of averaged out the um, sort of where most of the costs were coming from, it was around 40% uh, labor as a percent of, um, of total costs for all, all four of those crops. Um, and there was some other variability within that. So sometimes they would, sometimes th these items included a little bit of labor, but most, most of the time labor was listed as a, um, as, as harvest, as, as harvesting labor as being one of the most expensive pieces of, of the operation. Um, and so this differs significantly from row crops uh, where the cost of labor as a percentage of total costs um, is significantly lower. Um, you can see this on, on the chart on the right, which shows that sort of on average, most of the crops that are at the, at, on the higher end in terms of percentage of total costs being from labor are all specialty crops. And then you see sort of corn and soy at the bottom as, as that not being as significant of an issue. Um, and in fact, the, the dominating costs for a corn soy operation are seed fertilizer and, um, and chemicals. But, but you know, labor is going to dominate some of the conversation we have here going forward. But I would be curious, Walt and John, to get your perspective on, you know, while labor is the dominating factor in terms of farm operating costs, are there any other key drivers that you work with, with growers on? And sort of what are they thinking the most about? Because labor is not always in their control. So what are the other pieces of sort of the, the operating budget that are of the most concern that growers are tinkering with the most? Yeah, well, it's not surprising, uh, David. It's it's the top three problems when I was a kid are the top three problems today, right? Labor, water, food safety. Um, and what's really crazy about today is think about California, right? Food safety, uh, you've got recall challenges and product challenges. And here we go into another specialty harvest crop session and we'll we'll see how we can do this year in managing that water you've got sigma and historic drought conditions and yet with all that backdrop labor is the number one thing we hear about you know i've got a colleague dennis donahue at western growers we do the drive right from the bay area down to yuma on the five back up to 101 talk to probably 20 to 30 growers every couple of weeks we do the drive we're going going in a couple of weeks again and labor is by far the biggest challenge it's both in terms of both the regulatory cost pushing the the economics in a bad direction and the, just the core availability of labor. So I would argue 
you know, water and food safety right there in terms of concern, but labor definitely number one for the moment. Thanks, Paul. John, any anything that you're that, that you're you're working with with some of your growers on, and and other in, in in addition to labor, other things that sort of keep them up at night, or that they're looking looking for new solutions inside of some of these line items. Yeah, and uh, you know, along the labor piece, just to build upon that, even uh, right to echo what Walt. I don't think I've talked to a customer that says they're overstaffed. Uh, they need to cut people. Everybody's looking for. Uh, everybody's understaffed. But uh, I think one of the biggest things we hear from a lot of customers is what can they do? How can they become more efficient with the current uh, labor and current constraints that they have right now? As, uh, you know, as regulatory increases, as labor access and access to quality labor decreases, how can they produce the same amount of apples and better quality apples with the same resources that they have? And so that efficiency factor really, um, really has started to become top of mind for a lot of these big uh, fruit producers, even up in the Northwest, of uh, managing full transparency into managing their operation and how to extrapolate uh, you know, each detail from the field and maximize their ROI. So just more transparency into their true costs and the uh, opportunity to improve that. Yeah, the, the, you know, the, 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 something you just said reminds me of a conversation that you and I had, uh, you know, thinking about how especially crop industry isn't necessarily so much about yield per, I mean, obviously yield's important, but it's really so much more about quality. Um, can, can, you, can you talk a little bit about how your relationship, like what the relationship looks like for a retailer with a, with a producer? Um, and how that's different when you're focused on quality over like trying to get as much yield out of the land as possible. Like what, how does that end up looking different compared to something like a corn and soy operation and their relationship with the retailer? Well, I think a lot of it uh, from a retailer's perspective is gonna to be touch points on the farm. Uh, we see in the specialty, the, a lot more connection, uh, a lot more uh, connecting points to a retailer through uh, subject matter experts through nutrition, through pests, through water, through uh, fertility. And there's, you know, probably six to seven people that are connected on the farm with one customer working on a per acre basis to produce a better apple. Uh, whereas in the broad acre row crop, you, that, that person is one person that does all of those facets. And so uh, it's a lot more integrated approach. Um, there's a lot more risk. Uh, we on the uh, fruit and veggie market, we see a lot of uh, our business being risk management of how can we help the growers uh, uh, navigate through all the different abiotic and biotic stresses that are outside of their control uh, to uh, produce the best quality fruit. Yeah. And so uh, in, instead of maximizing the bushels in the bulk tank. And so th there is a kind of an inverse relationship there. And from the retailer side, yeah, a lot of it about is uh, connectivity with the customers. Yeah. Now it certainly seems like it's a higher touch operation and you simply have more people involved with the operation as a whole and sort of a, yeah, per, per farm. It seems like there's like, you know, five or six people committed from Wilbur Ellis who are all working on various aspects of them. Absolutely. Um, and, and sorry, we did it. We did have one question in the audience. I just wanted to clarify on this slide um, within the, uh, the line items of materials, contract and custom, which are uh, obviously very vague um, in, inside of that includes fumigation, soil testing, trays and clamshells were one of the major pieces of the custom line item um, in the strawberry operation specifically. So you wouldn't necessarily see that in other um, in other crops, uh, but I would encourage anybody to, to walk to, to click on the link for operating budgets below and you can go look at the cost uh, drivers for a bunch of these different crops. Excellent. So um, the next the next section here is focused on challenges and opportunities. Um, and uh, we're gonna focus on four, four key challenges that are in, in the specialty crop industry and we'll see if we can get through all of them and then also into the opportunities as well. Uh, the opportunities really meant to sort of be a preliminary discussion to allude to part two 
um, where we're going to bring some of the innovators who are working on technologies that we can think can solve um, some of these four, or at least chip away at some of these four um, key challenges um, that I'm, I'm going to come up with right now. So after speaking with the panel, uh, the panelists prior to today's webinar, um, we narrowed down the industry's core challenges to four or five key buckets. Um, there was general agreement that labor is the largest unmet challenge in the specialty crop industry, in specialty crop production to date, um, followed by water scarcity um, and food safety sort of tied, tied for tier two. Um, and then finally, regulatory compliance, which the more I read about regu regulatory compliance really is just um, largely made up of regulations surrounding issues one through three. So increased regulatory uh, costs around uh, human labor, uh, food safety, uh, and then water regulation, um, like the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, and so finally, there also is a problem at the consumer level on the food waste side. It's also at the farm gate level, because there's always going to be waste at the farm gate level. Um, but most of mo the majority of the waste that occurs in specialty occur occurs at the consumer. Uh, uh, but in general, the waste issue is significant at about 34 to 36% of total produce. And so you sort of look at that from an environmental standpoint, um, the numbers are, are pretty staggering. Um, we're not going to dive into that issue today. We actually have content that is on that specifically, but we're going to talk about the first four here. So I want to kick things off by jumping into the labor issue. Um, so to start, a, a few stats to frame the challenge. Um, between 2002 and 2014, um, the U.S. lost 146,000 field and crop workers, um, and that, that issue has continued to exacerbate. 56% of California farmers reported not being able to find enough laborers in the last five years. Um, and while availability of labor has fallen, cost of labor has increased as both a function, one, of, of scarcity, uh, but also, two, of regulation. Um, in the U.S., agricultural wages uh, increased 10%. As it, 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 on average, um, from 2014 to 2018, but in California, wages will have increased by 42% between 2017 and 2022, um, with the minimum wage at $15 an hour. Um, and as you can see on the right, uh, California and the West have been the hardest hit. Um, the inability to find sufficient labor, particularly at harvest time, is one of the reasons the U.S. has continued to see increased exports of uh, or Im sorry, imports of fruits and vegetables into the United States um, from countries like Mexico. So, uh, Walt, I have a question, question for you here, and others, please do feel free to chime in. Um, you know, while there's a number of significant issues faced by especially crop growers, you know, you and I discussed that this one really takes the cake. And so, can you give us a sense of, of how challenging the issue has been over the last 10 years? And in the same token, can you speak a little bit to the way in which, you know, harvest automation really hasn't matured quickly enough? Um, for the industry as it is really clearly needed? And do you have any perspective on sort of solutions that can help in the meantime? And I guess finally, any sort of perspective on the future of labor and automation and sort of how they coincide on the farm, given, that, given how immediate this issue is? Right. No, and I know you've got a slide with some comparison and how fast stuff happened over 12 years. And uh, I'll just tell you, it's, it's real for California agriculture. And that's, that, those are two Cal Poly studies that are really good because they were 12 years apart with the same farmer, same crop. And again, 800% lift in regulatory costs. And if you look at it, you know, three of the top four line items weren't even on the 2005 study, right? And they're on the 2017 study. So you go from 109 an acre to, to you know, 977 an acre. Uh, it's a massive hit. And along with that, the labor numbers you just outlined, David, are right. So, so what's happening is you're just seeing a lot of pressure. And we talk to the growers about this all the time. Why are we importing so much stuff? Because we're growing at other places, right? So the reality is a lot of this regulation is an attempt to, to grow agricultural products better in California and the U.S. And the, the FDA and USD are driving a lot of those regulations. And yet in practical impact, that has the effect of losing a lot of acreage for California. So you and I talked about asparagus. There were 60,000 acres of asparagus when I was a kid and lots of, lots of different growers. Imperial Valley was very popular for asparagus. And we're down to about 600 acres uh, today with much, much less grower impact. And it's to the point now where is there even a critical mass of asparagus for the automation folks, right? Um, so it's a great example. And at the same time, crops like strawberry, look at the Strawberry Commission reports the last couple of years, 
there's a critical mass issue with this regulatory cost that I just want people to, to think about for a moment. When you put all these costs onto the strawberry farmers and you lose a couple, you know, 50 acre fields here, 50 acre fields there in a county, the supporting infrastructure that helps with strawberries can no longer afford to provide in-county resources, right? So the equivalent of the Wilbur Ellis is on the strawberry side. Um, you all of a sudden start providing support from outside the county. So this regulatory cost has a twofold impact. Costs go up and then supporting costs go up behind it, the stuff that helps the grower do their stuff uh, effectively, and that just accelerates the trend. So, you know, the good news is there is some silver lining here. What's managed to save the day for a lot of this, while we have all this production growth the last 50 years and all the shrinking labor force that you mentioned, David, is automation, right? So whether it's thinning, planting, weeding, harvesting. It's never moving fast enough, but it is moving and it is having a big, big impact. And the one place that I would say is, is popping up on the radar screen is harvest aid, where you don't actually help harvest, but you help with things around harvest. So think about the uh, Gian Burrow, uh, Charlie and his team, I've worked with for a couple of years now. They don't harvest, but they run the, the harvested product back to the truck, which again, to the grower is you know, it solves some of that gap between the labor I have and the labor I need by by putting a little, you know, little flatbed truck on the way back to the to the real truck. So I think automation is going to continue to happen um, and harvest aid will continue to happen. But, you know, we're we're all doing automation and the harvest automation project we launched in Tulare in February with Western growers is focused on this because it's such a big percentage. Um, it's 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 the reality is it's going to take a while because you've got to build a whole lot of pieces, do a whole lot of field testing and, and get the economic model working. It's probably, I would argue ag tech is one of the hardest tech segments I've ever seen. And harvest is probably the hardest segment in ag tech, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely um, much easier said than done, unfortunately for how badly it's needed. Um, I guess, you know, I would, one thing I, I would just follow up on that when, when you talk to growers, do you get a sense of what kind of solution is the most ideal to them? Is it something that's more of a transitory, let's reduce the number of people we need and make them more efficient um, so that maybe we can pay them a, a better wage, but also just reduce the, over, um, the overall cost of, of production? Or are more growers looking for, let's get a silver bullet, let's get something out in the field that can pick, pack, sanitize, and sort of do the, do the whole thing? I think the former David really nails it. I think they're looking for point solutions that they can integrate into their operation. And, and just quite simply for all the ag tech entrepreneurs that are out there, the innovators that are out there, you know, fl flip the bit around. I see so many, I see a lot of decks from startups, right? And I love watching startups. I mentor a lot of them, work with a lot of them, look at them from an investment lens. And I would just say, you know, put your solution. Uh, here's, here's how I'll describe it. I see a lot of decks that are a solution desperately in search of a problem. And if you can't get your solution framed in terms of an economic problem that keeps the farmer up at night, keep trying. Um, because there's so many of you out there. We all see the increased funding numbers from Ag Funder and ADEX lift in funding over the last 10 years. That means more and more startups banging on growers' doors. And that means your pitch has to be that much better to get heard. So if you're talking, tying it to, you know, buzzwords like sustainability uh, that are interesting, right, and, re and relevant, but if you can't tie it to, I'm going to help you solve this problem with this kind of better economics, it's going to get hard to get above the noise. I would just add one thing, kind of echoing what Walt said on automation, because the crops in this sector are so different. Um, when you look at how can we build some harvesting um, incredibly expensive $100 million um, thing to put in the field to do harvesting, um, that's going to be a really big leap and it costs a lot of money. And I'm not sure the industry is going to be able to support those kinds of huge kind of silver bullet things like you were talking about. So these, these kind of half step harvest aids, like Walt was talking about, I think focusing more on that, like look at the whole system of harvesting and, and look for places that we can actually do something that's half a step instead of looking for the silver bullet that costs $100 million to build. That's fine. I, would, I would agree. I would even uh, go a step further of outside of the harvest realm. Uh, I think customers are interested in, you know, they're making multiple passes over the same acre in a year, depending on the crop can be up to probably 18 to 20. 
how can they maybe uh, with automation, can they minimize votes to go, you know, from 18 passes to 15 to 12? Can they do two, can an automated piece of equipment do two uh, operations in one and uh, minimizing their cost, uh, reducing the constraints on labor to get people to drive tractors? I think uh, growers are also interested in those type of solutions. Yeah. Yeah, and there's some inter there's some interesting ones that I've seen as well. Actually, in your neck of the woods, they're even as simple as we make it easier to count the number of apples on a tree. You know, which humans aren't that good at doing that. We're not very good at estimating how many apples are on a tree. So, um, yeah, I think there's there's a really interesting set of pieces of technology there, from the most simple to some pretty incredible pieces of machinery. Um, yeah, I would add one more piece of that, just as you're talking about that and thinking about things like breeding. You know, if um, like with broccoli and, and some of the other crops where you have to uh, harvest four or five times out in the field. And so you're, you're running over that field that many times just to harvest. And what can we do with breeding so that you only have to harvest once or twice? And so I think really opening up that solution set you know, outside of, of uh, automation, like you said, John, and, and what are some other technologies that can just make it you know, so that we use less labor? Right, right. Yeah, no, it's a great point, Bonnie. And I'll tell you, we've, we've worked with a lot of subject matter experts on harvest the last two years as part of the Western Grower Harvest Initiative. And it is really interesting. Your point is exactly right. The two things that optimize innovation impact the last 20 years are just that genetics is a major one in farming practices, right? So how can you present that food in a way that the harvester can see it better, understand which food to harvest or weed or thin and which to leave for later? Um, you know, 3D to 2D for the trees is huge, right? Just that type of genetic impact. So I think innovators that, that are able to plug into all three parts, the innovation itself, the, the mechanized part, and the genetics and the farming practice and build that story for the grower um, are going to have a lot higher likelihood for success. It's a startup, so never, never guaranteed, but it's going to help if you can do all three and tell the story. Yep. Excellent. Well, thank you all for, for your perspective there. Um, the next piece I want to cover is uh, water um, in the West. So anyone living on the West Coast knows that the drought has been a persistent theme for a long time. Um, and every time a new super drought comes along, the data is ever more foreboding, um, as you can see here. Um, right now, 72% of the Western U.S. is in severe drought, representing California's driest year since 1977. Um, and for some states, it's the driest year since the last 120 years of record keeping. Uh, drought affects all crops, um, but as you can see on the heat map on the right, it particularly affects the regions that we covered earlier that account for the majority of specialty produce production. I mean, as a result of this, farmers often face significant water restrictions that force them to choose not to plant, to plant uh, parts of their land or remove production entirely, um, sometimes in the case of, of tree crops. Um, and so, you know, question here for John and Walt, thinking through the drought in California and the West and Southwest, and Northwest more broadly, um, do you think things have reached a breaking point where it's not as feasible for there to be as much production in to occur in dry climates like California? And what should the industry be thinking about from sort of a long-term perspective as we, as, as climate is likely to become drier and, and potentially more variable? Well, I think- Yeah, uh, I can take, go ahead, John. Go ahead, Walt. No, I was just going to say, I, th I think what makes California unique is that Mediterranean climate that's, that is so friendly for a lot of these specialty crops. And I think what's really interesting is there's only a few places in the world that have that. And I think California has really done itself a disservice the last 50 years by not investing more in two areas that I think are huge opportunities. And we've delivered significant innovation globally. Um, and that is water storage and how you store more of it. Right now, a lot of it runs out from the snowpack and the, and the rainfall out back into the ocean, never gets captured. I uh, haven't done a new water project in, in California in a couple decades um, and haven't maintained the stuff that's here. And then desalinization for the counties on the coast, right, whether it's San Luis Obispo, Monterey, Santa Barbara, San Diego, and the rest of them, uh, we really haven't done any desal projects. So I think if we're going to take the drought seriously, and try and manage the water resources that we have, uh, I think we're going to have to look seriously at putting more infrastructure in place. And, and I think the Biden infrastructure plan is, a, is an interesting capital source for some of this. And I think desalinization has to be looked at. 
to date in California, there's been some forces working against us at a pretty major way at scale. Um, and we need to keep them at the table and talking about this because I think until we have more storage and more reliability, the situation's only going to get worse. Ironically, I'll throw this into the mix and, and see if the other folks have a thought on it. I actually think the regulatory environment is what's going to force our hand in water storage. If you look at where Sigma's playing out, and my sister's on our groundwater sustainability agency for our basin, you're going to see reallocations potentially away from farming. And the minute that happens, you will get massive lawsuits for water takings. And if you do the math on water takings and what that could add up to over years and decades, that may be the straw that actually breaks the camel's back and forces some water storage investment because it doesn't take too many of those to justify some investment in storage. But, uh, but we need something. We need innovation. We have it if we're willing to adopt it. Um, and there's better and better storage out there and better and better desal options out there. We just haven't adopted them in California while other regions have and gained the advantage. Well, I think, uh, you know, maybe talking more just specifically on the crop production piece during drought, uh, we've, we've put considerable effort into looking how can we help manage water uh, combined with fertility practices to in, uh, continue to produce high quality fruit and, uh, you know, grow, actually collecting a uh, database on water usage and what soil moisture looks like and how can we uh, compile that with and combine that with uh, fertility and other uh, agronomic uh, or horticulture uh, growth aspects to continue to grow apples and pears and cherries with minimal amounts of water or smartly timed applied water through our irrigation. I think uh, the old days of just um, you know, even in the potato ground of just turning the pivot on when it's hot to help keep things cold uh, is probably gone. <laughs> and how can we, uh, how can we better utilize the water resources that the limited water resources that we still have? I think that's uh, 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 still, there's a lot of room for innovation in that space. Yeah. Is it, is I, I would echo that, David. So, sorry, I, I, I would totally acknowledge John's point. I think there are a lot of innovations like DRIP over the last several years, uh, irrigation improvements. We've definitely seen some of that, and I think that's part of the solution. I think it's a portfolio of solutions that involve intelligent you know, conservation with sensors and equipment and DRIP evolving. And then again, we've got to think high level at a what about all the water that gets away from us? I think those two things working in concert, or again, the water costs will keep driving up, available will go down. And we know that that's going to push acreage outside of California, um, ironically, to lower regulated environments, as we mentioned earlier. So it's uh, it's an interesting trade off. And I think even going further to Bonnie, your point of earlier, uh, the breeding aspect of looking uh, at, you know, maybe drought tolerant plants need to be the uh, standard now <laughs> and a lot more. Uh, uh, emphasis on that. I think there's a lot of tools, uh, some cool genetic tools that are being developed that can address some of those. Uh, but again, the breeding process is also a, a long, uh, not not a quick fix. Uh, it's a long process to get to a solution. I think a couple of add-on points. Well, one of the things that's really changing in California is that we in the past, in you know our lifetimes, have gotten our water through melted snowpack. And to Walt's comment about infrastructure is we are now with climate change and going forward, likely going to get more of our water through rain. And so that requires a different kind of storage and, and a different kind of system that, you know, we're not really equipped for. So hopefully that will, that will happen. And then also um, I haven't worked as much on water technologies. I'm just starting to look into it. So there's probably a lot more out there than, than I know of, but I was talking to one company that is using sensors to, to help, um, just open irrigation ditches and close them, you know, based on um, different factors of, of need. And that helps uh, one with using less water and then two with using less labor because you don't have to send a person out. So I think there's, there's a great opportunity for using different types of technologies to solve um, these various different water problems. Yep. Excellent. Well, uh, Walt, Vani, John, thank you guys for your perspective on the water issue. Um, the, the next piece I want to I want to touch on um, and trying to move quickly through here so that we can answer some of these questions that we have uh, from the audience 
Yeah, David, I, I, I think I got most of that question. I, I think what I see on the innovation front that's interesting is I think we're doing a better and better job with testing products that can identify this, uh, the, the, the foodborne, you know, the, the pathogens out there that cause the, that cause the recalls. Uh, I think there's been good soil, water, and product testing out there for a while. I think those get uh, more scalable uh, better and cheaper every year, which is great. I think the on the truck stuff is emerging. I think there's there's some technology out there that's been in play for a while that's going to allow you to do food safety tests at the field uh, and get reports back a lot quicker, uh, which is great because when you think about a harvest operation, you know the number one thing you want to do is get get data as close to the pick as possible on food safety. So I think testing we've seen some great pro- progress in, and then I think in terms of Fix. That's really the new frontier for me is, okay, how can we fix this stuff? Because identifying it's one thing and keeping it out of the food stream is, is great, but, but not just identifying it, can we actually fix it? And there's some interesting solutions out there that I think will get to scale in the next few years that'll be, that'll be interesting on that solve. So not just IDing E. coli and cyclospore and listeria, but actually getting rid of them during the food production process. Um, those are the two yeah. places I see some nice innovation. I know. I know you'd mentioned a, uh, I think a, a sort of flash pasteurization uh, or, or uh, radiative technology of some kind, and I know we've seen some others that are in that universe as well, and, and those that are using cold plasma um, for, um, more for more for more for mycotoxins, but um, also applicable to some of the some of the food safety concerns here. Um, exactly. I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna jump through to the next one, because I know we're, we're we're starting to bump up against time, and I want to make sure we have time to cover all of the segments here. Um, and I apologize for this this grainy chart in in advance, but it is a good grainy chart uh, from a very good article that I would encourage anybody who's interested in reading about regulatory regulatory costs to read. Um, but I saved regulatory for last because again, the regulatory landscape, especially crops, has been heavily shaped by challenges in labor, water, and food safety management. So, in a study conducted by Cal Poly um, of a Salinas Valley lettuce grower, regulatory cost costs um, between 2006 and 2017 increased by 795 percent. Um, largely as a result of policies focused on improving worker wages and conditions, improving groundwater management, um, and reducing food safety recalls. So it's important to note that these are all important issues, um, and it goes without saying that growers, but it goes without saying that growers have borne the cost of the implementation of this regulation. Um, So obviously, these are all pieces where we want to have controls and checks and balances on these types of either natural or human resources. Um, but I guess, you know, Walt, I would have a question for you and, and any others who would want to chime in with a perspective, let me know. But, um, you know, do you have any perspective on where some of these regulations make sense, where they're probably pushing ag out of California and into countries like Mexico, where they have lower regulatory thresholds, and so that we end up importing products that are produced with a lower cost. So we're kind of just pushing the, the impacts that we were worried about in California and just pushing them off to somewhere else. Do you have any sense of what a balance looks like? I have a lot of perspective on this one, David. <laughs> I'll try and share it quickly. I think the place where regulations make the most sense is when the regulators ask for data um, and then can make some decisions based on the data. I think where it's proven much less effective is when they ask for a specific actions, right? So, for example, a lot of the field perimeter traps that you see around production agriculture, right? Those are those white PVC pipes that everyone sees. Those are those are pest traps, right? Those are rodent traps, and and asking for reporting data on that so you can identify where there are hotspots of activity is huge because if those rodents get inside the field, that's an awful lot of food safety risk, right? In terms of foreign objects getting into the food supply chain, and so asking for data on that is great. Um, mandating how they do it, not great. Um, and just to give you a cost structure on that, I talked to one of the growers in Salinas Valley who farms on our ranch. He says one full-time employee per 1,000 acres of specialty crops is required just to monitor those traps and do the reporting. And that's, that's an awful lot of expense, right? But it's the right thing to do. So specify the reporting, let the growers figure out how to do it. I would argue that's the right way to do it. The wrong way to do it, and this is one of my favorite pet peeves, is the hefty bag fences that wrap around those fields, right? That we all see those visual little black trash bag fences. Those create the appearance of food safety without actually doing anything for food safety. The deer jump over, the mice go under, the animals walk around if they're not fully enclosed and they can't be. And so I would argue 
prescriptively mandating fences around production agriculture, not the right way to do it. So there's a, there's a little comparison. Got it. Thanks. Well, um, before we jump, any any other comments, Bonnie or John, that you guys would want to add here? Okay. Um, so the last slide that I want to cover before we go into just some, any questions that we have from the audience, um, just just sort of starts to allude to some of the technology, just a, just a handful of technologies that are being deployed to solve some of these issues. And some of them we've talked about today, others um, we haven't. Um, but that, that these are going to be some of the solutions that we're going to cover in depth in part two of this deep dive series and sort of looking at the startups and technologies that are being deployed um, in this in this space. Um, I've highlighted a few here. Um, these include CRISPR and genetics automation uh, and robotics, um, rapid food safety diagnostics, um, water management solutions for sort of precision water management. Um, and then extended shelf life solutions to reduce food waste, which I know we didn't discuss a ton in depth, but I think there's a lot of companies that are really interesting that are working on this problem. And each of these really has the potential to improve crop quality resilience, crop resilience, reduce costs, and improve safety of, of food for everyone. Um, one of these technologies I, I spoke uh, with both Vani and John a little bit about, and so would be interested to hear your thoughts. Um, uh, we had spoken a little bit about opportunities for CRISPR inside of specialty crop production um, and, and the ability to use genetics to either improve the quality of crops or improve the resilience of crops. Um, and so across across both of you, are there any opportunities that you've been intrigued by to date uh, that CRISPR can help service? And is there in, any interesting work that you've noticed um, that you think is worth mentioning? I think... Uh... I think a lot of the interesting work that I've seen, uh, and maybe more uh, specifically focused up in the Northwest uh, around CRISPR has really been around uh, dealing with abiotic stresses. And so dealing with um, what uh, some interesting work around freeze tolerance and uh, tolerance to cold weather. Uh, we, uh, in the right in the fresh uh, tree fruit market, we deal with that quite a bit of uh, we get cold, uh, you know, close to bloom, and that can be pretty detrimental to uh, to crops. So, really looking at the uh, the abiotic uh, pressures, uh, stuff that uh, historically and traditionally we can't influence, uh, has been uh, pretty interesting. I've seen some work done, uh, very early stages around the um, soil salinity and soil uh, pH, some tolerance around that as well. Um, I'm not sure, uh, again, a lot of genetic uh, stuff is quite uh, early in development and takes quite some time. Um, and then you also pointed it out of, uh, I don't, I'm not sure where the stance is on regulatory and uh, as well as social acceptance. Uh, I think that's a big piece of it in the uh, specialty market so far. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree on the, on the, yeah, the regulatory piece seems like it's definitely a type of it's a product class that has seemed to lean heavily and especially the organic and non-gmo labeling piece and so undoing that is a is a labor in and of itself um bonnie did you did you have a, a thought yeah i think you know the regulatory piece at least in the us is is pretty you know we're on pretty strong footing with, with gene editing and that it it isn't regulated um as a gmo uh, in Europe, that it is still considered a GMO, and hopefully that will change. And but that's been one of the biggest slowdowns in the specialty crop area, um, because so many of the products and/or the genetics, the rootstocks and the seeds are sold into Europe. And so a lot of the breeding companies, if they can't sell to Europe, you know, then it's not worth developing because these things are really expensive and take a long time. Um, I've been working and kind of involved more on the consumer traits. Um, so looking at what can gene editing do for consumer traits like convenience. And there's a number of companies, um, Pairwise is one that is doing a lot of work on um, convenience types of consumer traits to get people to eat more um, fresh produce using gene editing, nutritional qualities, things like non-browning. So I think one of the things um, that we need to pay attention to, as John mentioned, is just the social license of using gene editing. And if we can come up with some traits that 
consumers are, you know, totally wowed by and will accept the technology because they really want higher nutrition or, or better flavor or longer lasting, um, then I think that's going to pave the way for some of these other technologies that we can use in the field. Um, cause it's a really strong technology. We just need to, you know, watch our, how we progress to make sure that, um, we have social license to use it. Yep. Definitely agree. Well, uh, Vani and, uh, and Walt and John, appreciate all your perspective here on the last number of slides. At this point, um, what I'd love to do is just jump briefly to our sort of Q&A um, section. I know we have a couple questions uh, from the audience um, that would be great um, if you guys have a couple minutes just to, to see, if, see if we've got any answers that, that might be helpful. Um, one uh, is from Ray Riley, and it's, it's too bad that John had to drop here, but uh, the question is what what input areas are growers looking for new solutions in? Um, Walt, I don't know if you if you had any thoughts or have heard anything from any of the growers you work with. You definitely see a lot of uh, natural tension between the chemical uh, area and the biology area generally, right? So can we do more with biology and less with chemistry? Um, you know, I was at the BioAgro conference on a panel a couple months ago with Pam Marone and crew. And there it sort of seemed like when, not if, biology takes over from chemistry. I think that's a little bit uh, aggressive. I think it's a, it's a portfolio mix of solutions. And I think as biological solutions show up that are better than chemistry or can perform better with chemistry, and again, I keep saying it broken record, but with the economics that work for the grower, I think they'll get a hearing and they'll get some field trials. Um, but just biology for its own sake, uh, it needs to be better than the stuff we're using now. And I think, I think that's starting to happen. Yep, agree with that. Um, and then uh, this question is from Connie. Hi, Connie. Uh, how, um, how do you drive scale? Um, how do you drive to scale up regional specialty crop uh, out production outside of the West Coast within the U.S.? So thinking specifically about uh, the, the Delta opportunity, um, uh, is, it, is it better to desal and figure out how to maintain California dominant exports, or is it better just to distribute uh, production? And if the latter, how do we work together to figure out tech investment in diverse crops and diverse regions? Yeah, I can I can take uh, take this one, Vani, and then jump in after. Um, I I think so. My argument for California, I go and mind you, I'm a born and raised Californian who's very proud of our agricultural heritage, um, and and. I would argue this, the, one of the strongest arguments for keeping ag in California uh, is that ag tech comes with it, right? So the reason that the U.S. and California is the number two market for a lot of ag tech innovations, in especially crops, is because everyone knows they need to be here. So I think your point is well taken. We could certainly distribute the production, and again, subject to Mediterranean climates or things like indoor um, but from a policy perspective, the reason to keep California ag strong is because then the ag tech innovation comes with it. So the GDP that follows ag GDP, that 50 billion that David mentioned earlier, there's an ag tech GDP that comes with that. And it doesn't take an awful lot of automation solutions on a per acre per year basis to get that GDP number pretty big. Um, you guys can find me on Medium for a few of my thoughts. I've got a few on this one, but the ag tech GDP behind ag is... Um, is pretty significant. Yeah, I think I would add that there is a lot of value to trying to distribute in other places just to, um, for one thing, just develop less complex supply chains that solve some of the problems. And so indoor is certainly one that, you know, most places, if, if you have money, if you can bring and attract the money there, but, um, you know, like App Harvest and some of these companies that are building in different places um, on indoor. So I think that's definitely one that we could, you know, pull cross country. Um, and there's a number of indoors that are trying to do that. I think also where it's economically viable and that, you know, Connie, I know you have a lot of views on how to look at different regions and, you know, how can we not, how can we not just have monoculture and just grow corn and soy throughout the whole Midwest. You know, are there ways to, to grow other things and how do you make that economically viable? But I, I, I think it'd be great to, to pull things across. It's just, if people can't make money doing it, they're not going to do it. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, and then uh, finally, um, we have one last question. I think we'll wrap things up here. Um, how does vertical farming uh, play uh, to improve the resistance um, 
of disease reduction um, or the reduction of the use of chemicals in fruits and veg. Um, I don't know if either of you want to provide any thoughts there. I think the opportunity in theory is that, yes, it could reduce diseases and reduce the use of chemicals. Yeah, I think most of the indoor farm uh, production facilities will tell you they don't use any. Um, I don't work there, so I don't know. It just seems like I bet they have some problems that, you know, come in on the media or come in on the seed or come in through people. But most of them will say they don't use any pesticides, but certainly because you don't have, you're not growing in an outdoor environment where um, I think Walt was mentioning earlier, you know, where you have all sorts of animals moving through the field and, you know, you're, you're using irrigation water that might have gone by, you know, a farm or a poultry production. And so I think the, the opportunity is certainly better indoors that you don't have all these um, outdoor things coming in. But I, I don't have the exact data, but most of the indoor places say they don't use any. Yep. Um, perfect. Well, uh, sorry, Walt, did you, did you want to add something? No, I totally agree with okay. Bonnie. Gotcha. Well, uh, before we wrap things up here, um, I do want to highlight that Walt and Bonnie both have awesome content out on the internet, um, that anybody who's interested in food and ag should check out. Um, Walt has a fantastic blog on his, um, on his medium. Um, there's some really, really interesting insights across ag tech in California, ag tech in general, has obviously done a lot of really interesting work in this space. Um, and then Vani, uh, do you want to, did you want to say something about, about the podcast that, that you've been running? Sure, sure. We're, um, yesterday I dropped the 25th episode. So I've been doing this for a year now and um, we have over 125,000 downloads. And um, I just, I look mostly at problems in the, um, in the produce area and then try to talk to startups and different companies that have solutions to the problems that we have. So it's been a, a really fun journey on the podcast and um, hope you take a listen. Excellent. Well, uh, I Bonnie, only endorse well, Bonnie's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Likewise. PMA Takes on Tech. You can go to our website or you can go to Spotify or any place where you listen to podcasts. Awesome. Um, and, and John, if you have uh, content on the web, I apologize that you had to leave us, leave us soon, but if, if I'll be sure to be sure to follow up on that. Um, Ronnie, John, Walt, thank you all so much for your time today. Um, this was a really, really excellent, fascinating discussion. Um, and I think provided a lot of clarity to our team and to other, hopefully others in the audience on sort of how this industry works and what some of the core challenges and opportunities are within the specialty crop industry. Um, as I had alluded to earlier, um, this is part one. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, uh, join us in August for part two of this deep dive series on specialty crops, um, where we're going to take a closer look at the startups and technologies that are working to help solve many of the challenges that, that we covered today. Um, we will have more information on what companies will be presenting um, as, a, as a part of this. It'll be a similar format to, to what we did today. Um, and the date in August is TBD, but probably going to be the second or, or third um, Wednesday of, uh, of the month. Um, otherwise, thank you everyone for your time today, both the audience and our panelists. Um, we really appreciate your support um, and, and, and thoughtful questions, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next month.